running through tonight's DevOps playground, which will be a hands-on with GitOps. Now, before we kick things off, just a little bit of background on the playground. So the playground was started back in 2015, and this humble community has grown from 10 people to over 5,000 worldwide. So thank you for supporting the playground by joining us here tonight. Our aim has always been to provide a platform to share and collaborate knowledge amongst all our members. And we do this by running a monthly technical hands-on session with some emerging and popular DevOps tools. The good news is each playground is run by a qualified ECS engineer like myself. So you know you're in safe hands. For those who haven't heard of ECS, ECS is an award-winning digital transformation consultancy. We adopt agile and DevOps techniques to rapidly upscale teams, accelerate release cycles, and drive minimal, meaningful innovation with our skill set covering everything from cloud adoption, digital engineering, data analy analytics, and customer experience. We're always also the sponsors of the DevOps Playground are always on the lookout for engineers to drive, keen to drive real change in the work. Now, before we get going, um, I'd like to ask everybody to sign up for the Slack community channel, which is linked below me in the YouTube description. Now, we'll have, you'll have to interact with our support staff tonight, who will be helping you guys set up your, um, your GitLab access and your GitLab repositories. So I'll be getting to these in a wee second. If you need a bit more time on a particular section, feel free to pause the live, section, live session and be sure to revisit from tomorrow once it's been pushed live to our channel. I think that's it. Let's go. So... As I touched on before, um, tonight we will be using GitLab um, to go through and adopt a GitOps workflow for deploying um, infrastructure and applications. To do this, we're gonna need you guys to sign up for a GitLab account. Um, you can do this by going to the URL displayed on the screen now. So if you go to gitlab.com forward slash dpg hyphen GitOps, that will take you to our group. Um, from here, you should be able to sign in and um, request membership. If you go to the second link, which is a bit.ly link shown below, this will take you to the GitHub page, which has got all our source code for tonight, as well as the hands-on documentation, which will help you set up your, your GitLab repositories and access. Now, as I was saying, a hands-on with GitOps. We're gonna, tonight, we're gonna be building a full deployment workflow, which we manage by merge requests. As I said, we'll be using GitLab for this to actually go and deploy some infrastructure and application to the cloud. Now, just to run through the agenda for the hands-on session. So tonight, we'll be setting up a GitLab repository, which we'll be using for our GitOps. We'll be creating environments from this GitLab repository using branches. We'll be performing automatic merge reviews, and then we'll be deploying to a testing environment. And after this, there is three exercises that you guys can pick up in your own time. And these in include tearing down the infrastructure of a deployed environment, introducing some failures to test our automated merge reviews, as well as deploying to production. So what is GitOps? Well, it's an operating paradigm which empowers developers to manage their own deployments using Git. So traditionally, um, releases of applications will be handled by an operations team. So the development life cycle of a piece of software or an application would, would sit with developers who would go through a process of developing, testing, and then publishing their finished application. The published application after this will then be picked up by an operations team who would manage a deployment of this to a production environment. Now, GitOps is, is actually taking these processes and automating them through the power of Git. So how do we do this? Now, GitOps depends on having a declaratively described infrastructure. And what that means is, is we know what the actual environment should look like. And then we have an automated process for making our environment match our described state. So how do we go about doing that? Well, we're gonna use one of my favorite tools, which is uh, HashiCorp's Terraform. Now Terraform is a declarative infrastructure as code tool, which allows us to perform deployments to the cloud using code as uh, the key is in the name there. So Terraform is stateful. And this is really useful because what it means is that Terraform can deploy infrastructure, but it also stores the expected state of that infrastructure. So if you perform a deployment through Terraform and somebody goes and actually makes a manual change to the, deplo the, the deployed infrastructure, Terraform will actually be able to detect what's changed there and will be able to revert it back to the expected state the next time it runs. So just to recap, Terraform automates deployments, which update the state or environments to describe states which are stored within our Git repo. Now, we're going to use a standard Git workflow with GitOps. 
and just a wee, wee bit of an in, of a, uh, intro to Git. Um, I'm sure everyone who's watching this will, will have some fundamental knowledge of Git, but Git is a very, very, very popular version control tool that allows us to manage source code um, in what's called a repository. And this allows different, well, multiple engineers or multiple teams of engineers to actually go and make changes and test these without actually affecting what's called the master branch. Now, a master branch is our tested and ready to go code. Now, we can create new features from this master branch by creating a feature branch from the master, developing our changes locally, and then pushing these up to our branch through what are called commits, which is what um, Git calls a change. Now, once we are ready with our feature branch and we think it's ready to go, we can create what's called a merge request to master, which will be a request to go and take the changes from our feature branch and put them into our destination branch, in this case, which is our master. Now, to go about creating our GitOps workflow, we'll be using a tool called GitLab. So GitLab is a Git storage tool. Um, it's, it's, um, you can deploy it to your own environments using GitLab on-prem. And you can also use gitlab.com, which we'll be using tonight, which is very similar to bitbucket.org or github.com in the way that we can create repositories and push code. And also provides CI CD functionality. Now, what is CI CD? So it's uh, continuous integration, continuous deployments. And we'll be adopting CI CD as part of our GitOps workflow. Now, GitLab allows us to create automated pipelines. These are CI CD pipelines. And perform, choose, sorry, to be performed at chosen stages in a usual Git workflow. And you can see just a wee, um, a wee visualization of a Git workflow here, where you start off with your master branch, create a feature branch and make your changes, and then go and create what's called a merge request. Now in this diagram, we have listed it as a pull request. Now pull requests and merge requests, um, they're just what the, the tool you're using names them. So people who use GitHub will be sort of used to pull requests. People who use GitLab will be used to merge requests. Now, what does a merge request look like? Here, I have a screenshot of a merge request I created in the process of testing out the, um, the playground we produced for you tonight. So you can see here, there's some details shown on the screen. On the screen. We can see the, the source branch here and the destination branch. So here we have a source branch called make domain name environment specific, which is being merged into a testing branch. Underneath that, you can see a couple of details around a pipeline, which we'll be touching on soon, as well as some approval steps and the history of the merge request. Now, out of the box, GitLab provides um, the functionality to review changes as part of the merge request. And this allows us to compare um, files from the, de the source and the destination and view the changes. The additions are displayed in green here and um, lines that are removed are shown in red. Now, this is really useful, but we're going to actually take this a step further by, by providing the functionality to automate reviews and deployment using the power of merge requests. So again, as you can see within the screenshot here, we've got a couple of pipelines that we're going to be creating soon. So the first one is called a detached merge request pipeline, which will run every time we create a merge request and it will go and analyze and produce a plan for our changes using Terraform. This plan will then be posted back to the merge request so you can view the, um, the changes. And then following that, once you've approved your changes, you can go ahead and merge the merge request, which will go and spin off another pipeline, which will, oops, gone one too far here, apologies. Yes, um, which will deploy on merge. So when we merge a request, we kick off a deployment job, which goes and applies our changes to our desired environment. And got a bit ahead of myself here and one of the really useful features of, of GitLab again is that if a deployment job or a pipeline fails we'll get an email notification straight away so we know what's gone wrong. Now for us to actually go about building deployments like oh, sorry deploying something we actually need something to deploy so I've gone and built a very simple application um, it's based on a an API we're going to create which is um, a to-do API. Now this is a what's known as a CRUD, which provides a functionality to create items, read items, update items, and delete items. The application itself will be deployed to AWS on a set of Lambda functions. Now, Lambda is just a tool for running serverless functions. Our, our code will actually be written in Python. And then we will use what's called an API gateway to map 
our API to our Lambda functions, which will then be connected to our user interface. Now, the user interface we've created is HTML based, so it runs in a browser and it communicates with our to do API we showed before. And you can see we screenshot from the user interface here, which shows a bit of the functionality. So there's a box to add a new to do item. You can mark everything is done and then you can move the items through the stages of to do in progress and completed. And then once they're done, items can be deleted as well. The state of all this is stored in a database on AWS, which means that when we actually leave the page and come back to it, we should still see the same results as before. Now, the access flow looks a bit like this. So you can see here we have our S3 bucket here, which will store our static content, and this is what we'll access within our browser. And um, when we make calls to the API, these get routed through the API gateway through a Lambda function, which interacts with our DynamoDB database. Now, we don't have to worry about the application at all, it's already built for, for you. Um, what we'll be messing around with today is actually going in and deploying this. Now, just to recap the agenda, we'll be setting up a GitLab repository, first of all, and then we'll be creating environments using branches and performing autom automatic merge reviews with these branches. And then we will go ahead and deploy to a testing environment. And then after this, there's three more exercises to keep you guys busy. So I'll just show you the, the details again. So if you can now open up gitlab.com forward slash dpg gitops, um, as well as the second link, which will take you to the GitHub repository, you should be able to see the documentation as well as our GitLab group. Now, um, when you get to GitLab, um, you can sign in, and for this, you can use an existing GitHub account, a Bitbucket account, or an existing GitLab account. Um, these are all detailed on GitHub, and I'll get into these shortly. Now, um, before we proceed, I was just wanting to ask, does anybody have any questions they'd like me to cover off now before we crack on with our, um, our hands-on? My lovely support team will be feeding any questions to me, but what I'm going to do right now is close off this presentation and then hop on over to our GitHub page. So you can see here that um, we have everything stored up on GitHub. Now this is a bit confusing as we have a, um, <laughs> we'll be using gitlab.com, but the source code is all stored in GitHub. This is just because we, we use GitHub as our, our main provider for the digital playground or the DevOps playground. And you can actually go through the, um, the DevOps Playground page here, where you can see all the, the past playgrounds that we've run. But just because I'm going to be very selfish tonight, I'm going to focus on my own event. So over on GitLab, you should be able to see this once you're authorized. So to do this, you should kick off by going to the documentation and then clicking on 000 access. Now, if we open up this markdown page here, you should see the steps that you have to follow to request access to our GitLab page. Now, um, as I said before, you can sign in using Bitbucket, GitHub, Twitter, Google, or Salesforce. So if you have any of these accounts already, feel free to use these when you sign up for GitLab. And then that'll actually um, allow you to sign up without having to, to, to have any email verifications from GitLab. Once you have your account set up, if you go back to the main group, you should be able to click this button here that says request access. and. At this stage, please reach out in our Slack support channel, letting us know your username, and then we will go ahead and accept your request to join the group, which will then allow you to go and create your repository. Now, I'll give you guys a wee second to catch up now, um, and then I'll crack on with actually creating my own repository. Now, feel free to follow along. If you want to pause at any point, also feel free. Um, and yeah, any, any issues you can find whatsoever, please shout in our support channel, and we'll be happy to help you. Oops, apologies there. Now, we are going to start off by pressing this button here, create a new project. What this will do is it will go and create us a GitLab repository. So click the new project button. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna import an existing project directly from GitHub. This means that you don't actually have to download anything locally to your own device. 
Um, you're not going to be messing with your own text editors tonight as well. I, I, I probably should have mentioned that at the start. Everything we're going to be doing tonight will just be within GitLab. Um, GitLab has its own web IDE, which allows us to go and make changes and commit directly to our repository. We'll also be performing merge requests again within the GitLab UI. Now, once you're in the new create new project page, if you go ahead and click import project, and if you take the GitHub clone URL, now this is important, don't just take the URL at the top of the screen or else you'll get an error from GitLab. You need to copy this code, code clone here, which should give you a URL which ends in the dot git extension. Now, if you take this URL now and go back to GitLab, you should be able to press repo by URL. Don't use GitHub unless, um, or yeah, just don't use GitHub uh, because this will actually require you to sign in and authenticate with GitHub. As you can see here, we're just gonna use the repo URL as this is a public repository, everyone has access and should be able to import it. So paste in the GitHub URL here and leave all these, all these settings here. Um, and if you just scroll down, what you want to change next, is your project slug. Now your project slug is the name of the repository. So we're gonna give it something meaningful. It's just, just a username usually. So let's just kick off by saying CMHR, that's me, Cameron Harper. And um, we're gonna leave everything as default. And then we're gonna click this button here, which will create our project for us. Okay, um, now that we have our project created, we can go and crack on with the first tutorial. Now, we need to change a few settings on our repository. Um, for you all to be able to do this, we have to actually speak to our support team again. Now, um, we need to add you as a maintainer to the group. Um, not to the group, to the repository, which will allow you to go and change your repository settings, as I mentioned before. So um, once the team has gone and made you a maintainer on your own repository, and to do this, you need to have your repository name and your username and provide that to us in Slack. You will then be able to access the repository settings. So what we need to change first on our repository and we can do this by going to the left-hand sidebar here under settings and navigating to the CICD page. So we need to go and modify the repository CICD runner settings. Now, the way that GitLab CICD works is it uses a service called GitLab Runners. The GitLab Runners executes um, Docker containers on a, either a shared computing space or our own dedicated computing space. Now, what does that actually mean? So. If we expand this section here, we can see we have a number of options for, for runners. So specific runners are runners that are specific to this repository. So you can go in and deploy your own GitLab runner somewhere, link it up to the repository, and then we can execute our CICD pipelines on this. You have another option as well to use shared runners, which are provided by gitlab.com. Now, you, anybody can use these shared runners in GitLab. However, with a standard free user, you only have 2000 CICD minutes a month. And to prevent everyone from having to use their own CICD budgets, what we've done tonight is we've actually provided a GitLab runner for this GitLab group. And if we scroll down, we should be able to see the runner here. Now this is shared across the entire group, so everybody's repositories will run on this, but not to worry. Um, through some magic scaling in the background, every request that gets sent to this will be um, routed through to another dedicated instance. So we need to go and click this disable shared runners button here. And this will prevent GitLab from trying to execute our pipelines on the shared pool of runners. Um, we want to do this specifically because the runner we'll be using tonight is already authorized to deploy some of our, or deploy our infrastructure to our AWS account. If we use the shared runner pool, when we get to the Terraform CI stages, we'll receive errors saying that no credentials could be found. So this is very, very, very important that we disable shared runners. Now, once you've disabled your shared runners, we can go ahead and move on to our second stage, which will be to configure our environment. Now, what do we mean by environments? Now, 
In this sense, or what we're talking about tonight, an environment will be an isolated place to deploy our infrastructure and application. So I'll just give you an example. What we want is we want a production environment, which is always live, which can be accessed by users, and it's always working and, and it's, it's, it's always running with an expected version. But we also want a place where we can go and test changes to either our infrastructure or application. And to do this, we use a testing environment and we're going to model our environments based on our branches tonight. So if we go back to our repository, we can do this by clicking on the repository link in the left hand menu, we should see a number of options here. So we can view our files in the repository here. So even if you wanted to go and look at the, the documentation on GitLab, you can go and do this. You can see that we're working on the master branch here, which is created by default. Now, what we want to go and do is we want to create a second branch now that we're going to call test. We're going to use our master branch for our production environment, but we also want our testing environment. So to do this, we're going to go into the branches section underneath repository in the left hand sidebar. And we're going to go up to the new branch button in the top right. What this will do now is it will take a copy of our create from branch, in this case master, and it will create a new branch with our provided title. So we're going to call this one test. Now there's nothing really special about this test branch at all currently. It's it's just a new branch, but we've defined within our GitLab CI CD jobs, we've actually defined some logic which will say that if we're on the test branch, we're in the testing environment. And if we're in the master branch, we're in the production environment. And then um, we'll, we'll touch on that later on when we actually go and look through the, the CI pipelines within here. But for now, what we want to do is we want to go and look at our branch, compare that to the master branch. Now, you can see up here that master is listed as the default branch. So whenever you go to the repository or create a new branch, by default, it will be from production. We can also see this protected icon here. Now, a protected branch in GitLab is a branch that you can only push changes to via a merge request. That means that nobody can just go and make a change and push this directly to master. Somebody always has to go and review and approve your change before it reaches master. So we want to do the same thing. We're a testing environment. We want to enforce changes to be pushed in there um, via merge requests. And we can do this by enabling test as a protected branch. Now, to change your protected branch settings, scroll back down on the left bar here, back to settings, and then click on repository, which will take us to the repository settings screen. Now, the third option down is protect branches. So you see it keeps stable branches secure and forces developers to use merge requests, which is what we're wanting to do tonight. So click on the expand button and you should see a section here called protect a branch. Okay, so we can already see that our master branch here is set as allowed to merge maintainers, but also allowed to push maintainers. What we're gonna do first is we're gonna actually go and set this to no one, just to make sure that again, we're enforcing merge requests to our master or production environment. Now, to enforce merge requests to our test environment, what we can do here is go and say, we want to protect our branch. So the branch we want to protect is test. We want to say that maintainers can merge and we want to say that nobody can push. And you can go ahead by, to create this protection by pressing the protect button here. What this will do now is this will reload the page and then we can go and confirm that our um, protected branch is actually enabled by again clicking expand and scrolling down here and we can see a list of the protected branches. And as we configured before, test and master are now only allowed to be merged by maintainers and nobody is allowed to push. So there we go. Now, now that we set up our protected environment branch, we are ready to go ahead and enable some CI. So um, we're going to go on to the third tutorial now, which is called 003 Enabling CI and Merge. Now I'll give you guys a wee second to catch up just while I go back to the repository screen. As I mentioned before, feel free to pause at any time if you just need a bit, bit more time to actually catch up. Okay, what we're gonna do now 
is we're actually going to go and enable CI on a repository. And to do this, we're going to create a feature branch. Now, the feature branch, as I said before, will allow us to go and make changes before we create a merge re request, either to a test or a master branch where we want the changes to end up. So to create a branch, we follow the same process as we did for test. We go to the left hand menu here, we click on branches underneath repository. Once this page loads, we can go ahead and press the new branch to create a new branch. And we're going to name this branch enable CI. Okay. Now that we have our new branch, we can see here we've been taken back to the main repository view. But we, this time we are in the enable CI branch. Now you can see our other branches here. So there's master. Again, we can see the status of master. So for test. And the same for enable CI. And right now everything is exactly the same because we've not actually made any changes yet. We've just created two new branches from our master branch. So they'll be in exactly the same state as before. So we are now going to go ahead and have a look at our CI pipelines first, as well as this CI file here. Now, GitLab CI works by looking for a file called gitlab-ci.yaml. Um, and what this does, as you can see here, is it describes a few areas of our pipeline. Now, we're first of all design, defining a set of stages. And what a stage is, is a different stage of our deployment pipeline. So, Actions within GitLab pipelines are um, grouped into what are called jobs, and jobs are deployed as part of a stage. Now, stages consist of, of one or many jobs, and they're all executed in parallel. Um, with stages, however, stages are executed sequentially. So we can see here that because we've defined these in order, um, test will be run before merge request, which is run before deploy, which is run before deploy static. And finally, we have destroy there. Now, um, we are going to look at the, the first two um, stages of our pipeline here, um, which we'll get to soon. Um, but just to cover off the rest of this file, so we have some variables here, which are shared across each of the CI CD jobs. Now, we, if we're just going to ignore the environment and the AWS region ones, and we are going to have a look at the username. So this username variable is used across our Terraform deployments to actually go and create our own unique infrastructure. So if everyone was deploying VPG GitOps at once, it would be issues. So we use our username as well as the environment name to actually title or sorry, name our resources when we deploy them. We'll need you to actually go and change this value, change me, um, but we'll do that soon. So I just wanted to touch on the, the other two sections here. So we have a cache here. Now, what a cache is in the sense of the GitLab pipeline is it allows us to store files between stages, so stages and jobs. So each time a stage or a job is executed, as I said before, it runs on a Docker container, and the Docker container will only have access to the repository. Once the Docker container is finished running, it's gone. This is the, by design for containers. Now, for us to actually pass in files between these jobs, we use what's called a cache. We've configured in two, two definitions of path to be added to the cache here. So we have a .n file, which will be used to pass information from our Terraform job to our deployment job later on. We also have this infra slash deploy.n, and this will allow GitLab to view the status of our deployment to our environment. So once we actually get to the deployment stage in exercise four, I'll go into this in a bit more depth. And finally, underneath here, you can see that we are including five files, and each of these files consists of a individual stage, um, sorry, a, a collection of jobs, so the first file test.yaml, we're gonna have a look at now. So if I go back to, well, there we are. So test YAML, we run a Terraform Docker image and we run a command called Terraform init. And what this will do is it will make sure that Terraform can initialize itself before we go and do anything. And this testing um, job is run every single time a commit is made to any branch except master and test 
And there's also another um, criteria for running this as well. So this will only run if things are changed within the infra directory. Now the infra directory contains all our infrastructure as code. And what this means is that if we go and create a new commit that changes some of our infrastructure as code, we want to go and make sure that Terraform can actually go and set up this infrastructure first. We do this by uh, initializing it first. Now this won't catch every Terraform error. Um, we can actually handle handle more cases when we get to the plan, which we're going to look at next. So if we go back to our CI directory. We're now going to have a look at merge review. Uh, this is the, the, the big thing we'll be playing around with tonight. But what merge review does is it performs two jobs. The first of all, which is a Terraform plan, which will go and make Terraform look at our described state within that branch of the repository. It will compare this to the actual state of what is deployed currently to our environment, or in the case of our initial commit, no state whatsoever. And it will create a plan of how it wants to get that environment into the described state. And what this will do afterwards as well is this will publish the plan so that we can view it within our merge request. And there is a second job after this, which is a quality scanning check. And we're gonna use what is called a linter now a linter looks at static code within a repository and it will run a set of tests against it just to make sure that the syntax is as expected. Um, there is an exercise in the, the fifth tutorial of how to actually go and introduce a failure which TFLint will catch if you want to have a play around with that. So we will be focusing on the merge plan infra job during this tutorial. Okay, so back to our branch now as I've, I've talked a lot let's go ahead and go and make the changes we need to go and enable ci so within our file browser of a repository ensure that you are on the enable ci branch and what we're going to do now is we're going to press this button called web ide and this will launch gitlab's web ide for us again we don't have to pull anything down locally tonight we can actually do this all within the console so we can go ahead and create our first change, which will be to this .gitlab CI file. And we're gonna change our username to something else. So I'm just gonna go ahead and use CMHR, so the Cameron Harper. But I'd recommend that you actually use your GitLab username here, as this will make it a bit easier to just uh, work out who owns what. Okay, so the second thing we need to do after changing our username is we need to rename this file from dot example just down to a dot yaml. Now we put a dot example extension there to prevent GitLab from running anything when we first initialize our repository. We wanted to actually get to this stage to walk you through what's going on before you go ahead and see a lot of pipelines executing in the background. So to make GitLab um, run GitLab, CICD, we have to go and rename this file. So if you click on this menu button here, so the, I think it's called a burger menu. Um, I got told that the other day. I'm not sure if that's actually correct. But if you click on our, our burger menu, we should have an option called rename or move. What we're going to do now is again, click this, and we're going to just cut out the dot example from the end. Once you've done that, go ahead and click rename your file, which will now add this to our changes. Now we're going to go ahead now and create a commit of the changes we just made. So just to recap on the two changes, we have, first of all, we've changed our username and second of all, we've renamed this file. So if we click on this button down at the bottom of the screen now to commit, we should be able to see the changes. You can see up the top that GitLab CI file has been renamed, removing that dot example from the end. You can see our username has changed. So you can see there, gotten rid of this section, which is marked in red, and we've introduced this section, which is marked in green. For us to go and make this change to our branch now, we're gonna create what is called a commit. And we're going to give this commit a message that actually describes what we're doing. So first of all, enable the CI by removing sample extension, added our username. Right, now that we've added the commit message, we can go ahead and commit this to our enable CI branch. Now, 
before we do this, we want to in untick this box that says start a new merge request, because what this will do is it will go and create a merge request to our default branch, which in our case is master. What we want to do now is we want to actually merge this first to test, which will then go and kick off a deployment to our testing environment before we go and merge to master. So again, we're, we're, we're creating our own Git workflow here where that we branch from master, we merge to test to test, and when we merge to master, once we validated our test. So go ahead and untick this start a new merge request box just to prevent that merge request from being created. And you can now click commit to go and make our change to our feature branch. Okay, we're still within the GitLab web IDE now. So what we want to do is we want to go and click on our repo name in the top left. As you can see here, mine is called dpgcmhr. So if we click on this to go back to project, we should now be taken back to the main repository view. What we're going to do now is we're going to actually go ahead and trigger some of our CI pipelines. And we're going to do this by creating a merge request. Now we can create a merge request through a number of different screens within GitLab, but just to keep things simple, we're going to go back to our repository branch screen here. Again, go to the left sidebar, hover over repository and click on branches. This should now show us our three available branch or active branches. So again, we've got master listed there, test, and then enable CI where we've actually gone and committed our change. So we want to now create a merge request through enable CI. And you can do this by going and clicking on this merge request button here. What this will do is it will actually create a new merge request from the source branch to the default branch. So again, to master. So we need to actually go ahead and manually change this now. So if you click on change branches, it should now be taken to the um, source and target branch screen. We will just leave the source branch as it is because that's on the, the enable CI, but we want to change our target branch from master to test. Okay, now that we've done that, we can go and click this compare branches and continue, which will then go and show us the changes between, oops, um, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself here. We can see the changes at the next stage. So let's have a look at our title. So we're enabling CI, but removing the example extension, and we've also added our username. Um, okay, so we need to do one thing before we go and submit this merge request. And what we need to do is we need to untick this box here that says delete source branch when merge request is completely accepted. Now. Um, if we're merging to master, it would be expected that we close off our source branch afterwards as it's uh, it served its purpose. We've developed a feature and it's now been merged to production. Um, however, as we are using it, our test branch as a test environment, we need to retain that branch after it's merged. So but after that, we can go and merge that same branch to master. Okay, so very important that you make sure that this delete source branch when merge request is accepted is untapped. Now, after this, you can actually go and see your commits and your changes below. And you can go and press the green submit merge request button to go ahead and create your merge request. Now, as you can see on the screen, we have what is called a detached merge request pipeline. What this pipeline is doing is it's performing all the actions that we described within the merge request.yaml file that we we're looking at before. So we can actually go ahead and view this pipeline by clicking on the ID, which is listed here. So let's go have a, a look at what is going on. So you can see our first job, which is to run the Terraform Lint has passed. If we go into the actual execution here, we can see the screen, which shows the, the execution log. Now you might have noticed this um, fatal 403 forbidden. Um, this is, actually a, um, a known, well not, not an issue at all actually. What it's doing is it's um, trying to restore the GitLab cache here. And as we've actually not executed this before, there is no cache to restore, hence why it's getting a four or three error here. If 
we go back to the pipeline now, we want to have a look at our plan job. Now, if we go into here, we can go and view the Terraform plan from the, um, the Terraform code base to what our environment wants to look like. So if we have a browse through here, we can see what's going on. So Terraform is initializing the modules that we've used in our infrastructure as code. It's finding the, the provider. In this case, we'll be using the Amazon Web Services provider. And um, we don't really care what's going on with the initialization of Terraform. We're actually caring here about what's going on with the plan. So if we scroll down here in this green mark text here, we can see that we're creating a workspace using a command called Terraform new workspace. Now what this is doing, is it's creating a place for us to actually store the state of our environment. So if we try to go and push to a test environment where everything's called test, and then we just try to push everything called prod afterwards, what we'd get is some problems because um, there'd be a conflict in the state. So what we're doing here is we're actually storing our Terraform state within a workspace, which is titled after a branch. Now, the master branch is mapped to the, mass, the production environment and at the start of um, each one of the Terraform stages we actually include a line of bash which goes and changes master to production or um, just uses test. Now afterwards we are telling Terraform to execute a plan command with our environment information as well as our username here and to output it to a file called plan. And if we scroll down here, we can see Terraform is analyzing all of the code within our repository and it is seeing what it should look like at the end. Now if we refresh our page now, we should be able to see the test summary. Now, what Terraform is telling us here is it's analyzing the changes which are described within the um, the plan and we should be able to see some changes here unfortunately we can't um, I'm just gonna have a look at my CICD settings just to make sure that we're using the correct runners yeah that seems fine okay so um, I think this is potentially that we might have gone and deployed this same thing earlier on today hang on a second Did I actually commit my change? <laughs> uh, we have the demo effect as always, everybody here. Apologies, bear with me just for two seconds. I'm gonna go ahead and look at our enable CI branch here. Ah, okay. We can see here that I um, I actually forgot to go ahead and um, push the, the username change. <laughs> this could have been embarrassing. Okay. so. Let's go back to the web IDE um, and we can go and actually make this change now. So again, within our enable CI branch, um, we're gonna go to gitlabci.yaml and we're gonna change change me here to CMHR. I don't forget to spell my own name, which is cracking. <laughs> okay, once we've done this, um, go back to our commit button there and say this time we actually change what we wanted to do. There we go. So um, if like me, you got to that plan stage and then you saw that no changes need to be created, um, you'll know why. So if we go back to our pipeline now, we can actually see or a pipeline views here, we can actually see that the job is being triggered again. So if we go back to our merge request here, as we have now committed a new change to this source branch, which is part of a merge request, GitLab will go and rerun the pipeline. So you can see again here, we have a new in progress detached merge request pipeline going on. So if we actually go ahead and look at this now, fingers crossed what we should see is a much bigger plan running with some actual plan changes in place. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Happy days, everyone. So um, we can tell now that something's going on here because the, the workspace test doesn't exist and Terraform has gone ahead and creating that workspace. So I'm feeling a lot more confident about this plan execution. Right, if we uh, scroll down now, 
I'm a I'm praying a little bit now that this has actually happened. <laughs> we should see um, a list of changes, which we should have seen before if I'd actually gone ahead and followed my own um, tutorial. Now, um, we're not going to look at every single resource as there's quite a few which are deployed through um, Terraform. If you do want to have a look at the Terraform code base on your own time, feel free. Um, what we can do as well is we can provide some links to some good tutorials for actually looking into looking into how Terraform works. And if you're so entitled, um, ECS also provides um, Terraform training. But again, this isn't a marketing exercise, so I'm gonna, I'll keep quiet about that now. So if we have a wee scroll through here, we can see lots of different resources that are being described and defined. And we can also see next to on the left, we have this green plus sign. And what that means is that we're gonna go ahead and create a resource. Now, later on, we might get to a stage where we're actually going to modify existing resources, which would be um, described as either a um, a yellow tilde sign, I think that's what it's called, um, uh, or a red minus sign, which will reflect that we're gonna go ahead and destroy a resource. But because this is our initial run, all we're doing is we're creating resources. So we could analyze this plan all we wanted, but um, there are, Lots and lots and lots of lines. Let's have a look down the bottom. There's 12, 16 lines to get through. I don't think uh, we anybody has time for that. So what we're going to do is we're going to see a condensed version of this Terraform plan, which is both directly within our merge request. Now, if we go back to here now and refresh our page, we can see that the detached merge request pipeline has successfully executed with a green tick. And now this time, when I click on expand at the Terraform report, we won't see zero changes planned. We should see at least 100 or 55. So I'm getting ahead of myself here. But yes, um, that's a good sign. At least it's better than before. So now that we've gone through our plan and we've had a look at our changes, we want to actually go ahead and deploy these changes. We can do this by jumping on to the next tutorial, which is 0004, deploying to test. So I'll just give you guys a wee second to go ahead and open that up now. Okay, so if we go ahead now and click our merge button down here. Now, actually, just, just one more thing. Um, GitLab allows us to enforce approvals on um, repositories. However, um, that is outside of our subscription tier. So if you want to pay for the, um, I think it's, might be enterprise or something like that. There's different tiers within GitLab that allow you to use different features and um, enforcing approvals from a maintainer is is one of the features that's outside of our current plan. But what you can do is just, just to give that extra tick, I'm gonna go ahead now and click approve. And what this will say now is that Cameron Harper over here, which you can see from my, uh, my surprise Pikachu, has approved this branch or this merge request. And what that means now is that I will be responsible if I go ahead and merge it and create any changes that we were not expecting. So a bit of responsibility here. Now, I think touching on responsibilities um, is probably probably quite good now. So again, we're, we're shifting the, the traditional operational deployment role from an operations team over to the developers themselves. So this audit trail is actually really, really important because we want to just make sure that, okay, something changed and it was approved. Well, why was it approved? And we can trace it back using our Git branches and actually see, okay, this was part of this feature here. So this is why this changed and this person here like went and approved that. But which isn't part of a witch hunt. It's actually more of a fact finding mission. So you can actually figure out how to improve your processes next time. Now, Let's go ahead and click merge, which will go and kick off our deployment pipeline. So similar to a plan, what Terraform is now doing is, is again, refreshing the external state to make sure that nothing has changed between the, the plans creation and it being applied. And then it will go ahead and start deploying our infrastructure. So We've, by design, we're not giving console access to AWS this evening um, because we wanted to stress that all of these infrastructure and application deployments and operations can all be performed even within a web IDE, within a web browser. But once we actually start um, deploying stuff now when Terraform gets there, I'm just gonna open up AWS and you can start seeing that some of these resources are actually being created just in case you don't believe me.
Uh, you can see some of the, the Lambda functions the guys have already created when we were doing our, our dry run deployments earlier on. And we can see as well that some other people are, have um, resources here too. So clearly everyone's uh, getting ahead of me here. That's good to see. Um, okay, so if we go to our deployment log here, we can now see that some Lambda functions are being created, the ID of which is displayed here. So we can see dpg get op cm harper. Let's have a look just to see if they're there. There we go, there, oops. Pull up someone else's code there, apologies. There we go, we can see uh, see a number of users now have their, their test environment functions are now being deployed. That's a really good sign, good work guys. Okay, um, the job worked, which means that our um, environment deployment was successful. So um, there is a secondary job within this pipeline. I'm asked to deploy our static content. So our user interface, which is, um, again, um, stored as code in the root of the repository within the static directory, and it is deployed to a S3 bucket, which is made publicly accessible. Um, and the Terraform apply, what it does is it creates the, um, the bucket name, um, but it also outputs the bucket details as well. You can see here that we have a number of outputs here. So there's the domain content, which is how we actually go ahead and access our user interface. And there's also the S3 bucket name here. So in my case, it's called dpg GitOp chr cmhr test static content. We can see afterwards, what we're doing is we are passing this S3 bucket name here to a file called static bucket.env. And what that means is that um, we're, we're leveraging the power of the cache, um, which is shared between different jobs within the pipeline. And we're passing that static bucket name through to the next job in the pipeline. So if we go back, we should be able to see now is our static deployment job listed down here. So if we refresh the page because I think it was still lagging behind. You can see the deploy static job has passed too. So if we go and have a look at this one now, we can go and see what it's actions it's performing. So the first thing we do is we run the command source on that static bucket environment file to pull in the bucket name that again was created by Terraform. We go into the static directory and we run this command AWS S3 sync. Now the two options that we use here are the dot, which means we are pulling content from a static directory. And the destination is the second one here. So this is an S3 bucket with the variable name static bucket again. So static bucket is a variable which is set in the static bucket.n, which has been created by the last stage that we ran or the last job that we ran. Okay. Now that we can see that the static content has been successfully um, deployed, if we go back to our Terraform deployment job now, what we want to do is grab one of the outputs. Now, um, I mentioned before that one of the outputs is S3 bucket, so that's the name of the S3 bucket where the content is stored. But the other one, which would be an important one for us, is the content domain. Okay, so this is how we actually go ahead and access our user interface. So if you go and copy that URL, what we need to do first is type in HTTPS, paste it in here, and then you can type in forward slash index.html. Now, usually with S3 static buckets, um, S3 will automatically redirect you to index.html if you don't include the, the name of the file we try to receive. Um, however, I can actually get that to work. So that's why we're, um, we're, we're adding on the index.html at the end. And now what we should be able to see is our deployed to-do list application in our testing environment. Now, if you want to go ahead and test the application now, you can just have a play around with it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new to-do item. Okay, as we typed in here, we can go and create it by pressing enter on our keyboards, which will go and make a request to our API to go and create the playground um, item. Now, as I said before, this is all stored and accessed by an API. And um, again, the API interacts with Lambda functions, which interacts with an underlying database. And what that means is if we go and refresh the page, we come back and the item's still there. Now, what we can do to progress the item between the stages of to-do in progress and already done is simply click on it. So there we go. We can see now that he's been moved in progress and we've got another icon there, as you can say, so continue the playground and we want to just go and complete that now. 
So um, I think there's an old issue that I had earlier on where the deletion functionality wasn't working, but I'm just going to go ahead and try it anyway. So in theory, if we go and click on this X icon now, what we should do is go and create a request for our API to go and delete this item. Now, no promises this is actually work. Oh, must have just been a, a demo issue earlier on. So again, if we go and refresh our page, we can see that there's no items anymore. So there we go. We've, we've tested our application, we've deployed it to a testing environment, and we validated that it actually works. Okay, so now we can go ahead and deploy this to production. So this is included um, in the third set of exercises, or the fifth set of exercises, that's called 005 exercises, um, where we have a number of different exercises you can perform. So there's um, three. So the first one is introduce a failing Terraform lint execution. The second of which is to deploy to production. And then the last of which is to actually go and um, destroy our environment. And um, it looks like we're going to have plenty of time for me to actually go ahead and go through all of these additional exercises tonight. So um, again, if, if you want to go to 005 exercises now within the um, repository, we're going to go and start the second of these exercises i think is it the second of the the, the final exercise um just to get ahead of ourselves so to do this we are going to go back to gitlab we're going to go back to merge requests so we're not going to go back to merge requests we're going to go back to our branch view and we're going to go and find our enable CI branch. This time again, we're going to just do the same thing, but we're going to create a merge request this time to master. So when we go to the merge request screen this time, we will be using the default values um, in a way that we want to delete our source branch after the merge request is accepted. Because again, the source branch has now served its purpose. It's uh, We've implemented our, our features um, isolated from our master branch. We've deployed them to a testing environment and we've validated these. So now this is actually ready to be mass merged to master. What we can do within the description is we can actually link in our um, test pipeline here and we can put it within our description saying this has been successfully tested on the test environment as part of apologies. So um, what I did there is after I added my description was I went down and clicked the um, submit merge request button down the bottom. So the same thing is now happening again. We are performing a merge request pipeline, which runs a Terraform lint and a Terraform plan, which um, will generate a report of our changes, which again gets fed back to this merge request, which gives us a nice easy view to see the number of resources within Terraform that are going to be added, the number of resources in Terraform which are going to be changed, and the number of resources within Terraform that are going to be deleted. So this will take some time to run, so we can actually just go and have another nosy on our pipeline. We can see, as expected, merge lint is passed. Um, merge plan is now in progress but this time we are running on the production branch so we've got a production environment which is named prod and as i touched on before if we go to the start of this execution we should be able to see there's a command here where is it gone yeah command here says branch name is either the what is the ci merge request target branch name only if the name isn't master and again that maps to our prod end name else we will use the target branch of the merge request what this means as well is that we can actually go ahead and create multiple environments not just our test is if we create any other environment or any other branch we could have uat testing for user acceptance testing we could have integration testing um we could have system integration testing non-functional testing we could have a number of different environments like um it's just as long as you have a purpose for them, you can create other branches and follow the same merge request here. So, sorry, this, the merge request workflow. So again, as we use the target branch name, any target branch with a merge request can be treated as an environment. Now, this gets a bit tricky if you want to merge changes between feature branches um, in this workflow and how you configure CI, that won't work because what you'll end up doing is you will end up creating a, a new environment called whatever your destination feature branch is. We don't want to do that for now. 
However, like the uh, the concept of the of ephemeral environments within um within this model could actually work. So if you you'd um, create a branch, you could have a automated terraform job, which whenever you actually create a change, we go and try and deploy them and destroy those changes just to make sure that you're um you're actually developing working code. But um, that's just a bit too complex for our own workflow here. We want to keep it simple by just using merge reviews to perform these actions. So if we now go back to our merge request for production, we can go and refresh the page again and see the same results in the Terraform test. Again, 55 to add, zero to change, zero to delete. This time we're gonna merge and delete the source branch. And there we go. So enable CI is no more. The changes have been applied to both the test and the master branches and the deployment pipeline for production is now kicking off. So again, um, we will have a very similar output here, but this time, instead of us getting a URL that has test in the name here, it will have prod. So while that is running, I am just going to go and have a look at the other two exercises. So we have, the second one is to go ahead and actually destroy an environment. So while production is deploying now, I'm just gonna leave this spin in the background. Um, now that our testing environment has served its purpose, we can go ahead and tear it down because we don't wanna have any residual um, resources after they're actually required as these, these are messy, first of all, they cost money and um, there's service limits too. So it does make sense for us to go ahead and tear down our Oh, we've had an error here. This seems to be the same problem as before with the duplicate naming scheme. So let me go and have a look again. What are we calling this? Where's our username? Always love a bit of live debugging. So if I go back to my plan now, we can see what went wrong. Okay, so username there. Okay, so you've got your Lambda functions. So is my username actually included anywhere here? So let's have a look. CMHR, yep, so CHR prod should be listed there. So what is being created called prod prod? Hmm, I'm unsure of this. Let's go and have a look at our plan again. So that theoretically shouldn't exist. So I'm not really sure what's going wrong here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and retry the job just to see what's going on. Oh, I can see what the problem is. Um, massive apologies. I seem to have made an error in this commit here, which is actually set our username within our CI file for production to the username being the name of the environment branch. Okay, what this means for everybody is now that our, our production deployments won't actually work because again, you'll see this issue with our um, with the duplicate name there. Okay, so um, if we just forget about production for now, um, what I'll do after is I'll go and push the actual changes that we, we were supposed to make to the, the GitHub repository. So that should go and update that there and we can send around an update as well, which will just say which file to change. Um, but just, to give a demo of this one, I'm gonna go and fix this now within our web IDE. So if we go back to our branch now. So we wanna to go to, oh, we've already deleted our source branch. Oh no, okay, right. So let's go ahead and create a new branch to resolve this problem. So we're gonna call this um, production should deploy username, just to give that a meaningful description. We can create this branch from master again. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna go into the web IDE and we're gonna go and have a look at the CI file here, which is deploy prod. We're gonna resolve this bug straight away. So if we compare this to deploy test, right? And if you have a look at this line here in line 14, we have a Terraform apply, which passes in the environment name here and the username here. 
But if we go back to deploy prod, what we're actually doing is we're saying we're going to use the username within the uh, no, the environment name within the username, which is incorrect. So to resolve this, what you should do is go and take this username value here from test and then just pop it in here. So the username variables correct name within info prod deployment should be um, username. Now, before we commit this, I'm just going to go have a look at our destroy job as well and just make sure the value is correct there. So you can see, yep, in this case, that's correct. Cool. Okay, now that we've resolved the issue, so resolve bug that deployed duplicate name instead of username. Okay, um, we're going to circumvent our test process this time around by deploying directly to master or merging directly to master. So we can just leave the start a merge, new merge request there and go and click commit. What this will do now is this will take us directly to a new merge request from production should deploy username into master. And we're just going to go ahead and submit our merge request. Uh, and we are going to skip our plan this time because we know that the result of the plan should be exactly the same as the one which was performed before. And this time we are going to, as, um, and we, we know that because we've not actually introduced any changes to the merge request pipeline. Okay, so if we had gone and made any changes to either our infrastructure or the merge request pipeline, we would still actually respect this job here and we'd wait for it to finish running. But because we know that we've not actually gone and made any changes, we can accept the responsibility to go and merge this immediately. Okay, what this will do is it will say, instead of waiting for this pipeline to finish, we'll actually go ahead and brute merge that right into master now and kick off another apply job. And this time, oh, sorry, not a job, a pipeline. And this time when we go to our pipeline and look at the deployment infrastructure job, Terraform should be deploying to um, username prod instead of prod prod in theory. So let's just, um, I guess, sit back and wait. Okay, this time around we can now see that Terraform reply is actually using the username as um, as it should be. If we scroll down now, we should be able to see that, there we go. So stuff is now running and we can actually see within this ID here, dpg gitops cmhr prod lambda list for all. Okay, instead of having gitops prod prod, we now have the name as expected. Many apologies for that bug slipping in there. Um, as I said, I'll push this changes right out to the GitHub repository after we're done um, and actually put in, a, put in a note on the playground saying that if you already have the code, this is how you go ahead and uh, make the change to actually make it work. So just to recap on what I did, um, we can go into the, the commits view here in repository. We can see the change here, resolve bug that deployed duplicate environment name instead of username. So if we go back into this, we can see the change that I made, which is to go and change this value, CI environment name here, to username down here. Now if we go back to our pipeline now for production, we should see that the job has now succeeded. So just as we did before, let's grab this URL we're going to go and look at the pipeline just for waiting until the um, static content has been deployed. And we can see here that that was executed successfully. So now if we go and create a new tab right next to our, um, our existing test tab, oh, I forgot a slash there. So if we go and look at this one now, what we should see is a very similar user interface to our testing environment. So they're identical here, but what we're going to do right, is we're going to add a, just to show that these are actually two different environments, just so you believe me, I'm going to add two separate items to each uh, to do this. So this one here, the, this is a production test. You shouldn't see me on test, test. Oh, testing on production, should be doing that. Okay, so let's go ahead and put our production test into in progress here and go back into our testing environment and refresh a page. So as expected, we don't see any of our to-do list items here.
However, I'm pretty sure I deleted this one previously, so maybe I was correct in that deletion is not working. Or not, it seems to be functioning just fine. Okay, now what we've just demonstrated here after fixing that horrible CI bug that I'd uh, committed is that we now have two isolated distinct environments we can access our application, run tests and all these things on. Um, or sorry, we shouldn't be testing on a production environment. What we should be doing is we should be using the production environment as a production service. So we should be using this as a to-do list application. And then we should be using this test one to ensure that any changes that we introduce through feature branches um, actually work and don't cause any issues on production. Okay, now that we have um, both a production and a testing environment, we can go ahead and get back to the destroy environment exercise that I was mentioning before I realized the uh, production issue. So if we go back to our pipelines now, we can go into the CICD section on the left and we can go into pipelines. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna look down for the one that we performed earlier to our test branch. Now we can see this one will be here, where is it? Ah, there it is. You can see the test one there. So if we go into this and click on the pipeline ID, we should see our two jobs, but we should also see the third job here, which is called destroy infra test. And this will use Terraform's destroy functionality, which will go and look at every single resource that we created during the apply stage, and it will go and actually delete these. So they won't be, um, they won't be stored in AWS anymore or deployed to AWS, should I say. Now, this is a manual stage and it's executed at the end of every single um, deployment if you go and trigger it. So there's a similar one for production, which we can go see soon. But as I said before, this is a manual. So you do have to click the stop button here, which will go and stop the environment. Okay. So now if we go into here, we can actually go ahead and have a look at the execution of the destroy command. While this is running, I think it's probably a good time to um, jump back to any questions that you might have. So please um, feel free to ask them in the YouTube comments and then our support team will, will sort of send them on to me and I'll do my best to answer them if I can. Okay, we can see that if you look at the, um, the status on the right, I know the logs are actually progressing quite quickly here, but we can see that the destructions are actually happening here. And what Terraform is doing is he's going, and as I said before, deleting everything we deployed in the apply stage. So what this means is the next time we go and deploy to the test environment, we'll have to go and deploy a full environment, which will take a bit of time. Um, whereas the next change we make to production, it will be quite quick as the environment already exists. Okay, that wraps up the um, destroy exercise. And we can actually go ahead and validate that the destroy has worked by going to our um, testing environment here. Refreshing the page, and there we can see the specific bucket does not exist, and we can see that there. Um, it's been deleted. So if I just go ahead and go back to the Lambda screen on AWS, just to prove this, you can see here that was my existing test resources there, and then they're still actually cached here. But if I go ahead and load this now, ah, we can see that zero matches are found with this prefix here. So this is to just validate that the Lambda functions we created before have actually now been destroyed, as well as the S3 bucket, which we use to use our user interface. So from our point of view now, the testing environment no longer exists. Okay, so what we're gonna do now as well is we're gonna finish off the final exercise in tonight's playground by introducing a TF lint failure. And what this will do is we're gonna be ensuring that one of our pipeline jobs within our merge request. And if we go back to the actual job definitions within our repository, do this by going to CI there and clicking on merge review. And if we now look at the, the second job listed here, we have lint terraform. 
But what this does is it looks at the Terraform static code and it ensures that we are using the correct syntax. It's not doing any unit testing or anything fancy like that. It's literally just analyzing the syntax. So we are using the version 13 of Terraform um, and there is a syntax change between versions 11 and 12. And what we're going to do now is we're going to go and revert well, like a piece of Terraform code to a Terraform 11 syntax. Okay, so um, I'm not expecting you all to know the ins and outs of Terraform syntax. Um, I'm actually going to give you a demonstration of how we do this and exactly what to change. So now if you, if you pull up your branches again, we're going to create a new branch and this time we're going to call it um, deliberate failure. Okay. We're going to branch from master and we're going to create this now. Now, if we open up our web IDE, which allows us to edit the code within the console, you can just go and click this here. We're going to go and enter our infra directory here to look at the Terraform infrastructure's code. And then we're going to look at this outputs.tf file here. Now, what this file does is it defines um, outputs from our Terraform execution. And there are two which you should have seen earlier. So there was this static bucket name, which is here, and then the domain content, which we actually use to access our user interface. Now to test the linting functionality of that linter job, I'm gonna go and change this from a Terraform 12 syntax for a output attribute to the Terraform 11 and previous syntax, which involves using quotes, curly braces, and dollar signs. Now you can see that we actually use the same syntax above here within this string, and that's because we are concatenating two strings here, or sorry, we're appending this string onto this value within Terraform. But if you're just uh, referencing local.prefix, what you would do is you'd have it um, without the uh, brackets or the dollar sign of the quotes, it would just be sitting there by itself. And we can see what the what the change looks like again here. So as I said before, no curly brace, no quotations and no dollar sign. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go and untick the start and new merge request. Okay, because we want to merge this again to our testing environment. We don't want to introduce any deliberate failures into production. And um, we're not doing chaos testing tonight, unfortunately. What we're going to do is we're just going to give it a another commit message here. So I am testing the TF linter job by introducing a deprecated spell, deprecated syntax in the outputs.tf file. Okay, so we can go and commit this deliberate failure here by pressing commit. So again, we're, take, we're still on the web IDE. So we want to go back to our main repository here by clicking on go to project again, dpgcmhr. This time we are going to go to branches again, find deliberate failure here and we're gonna go and create a merge request. Now we can see that a pipeline is already passed through this here because um, that test stage that we have, which runs the Terraform init command every single time that a change has been made to the infra directory, this has now actually been executed as we're changing the infrastructure directory. So Terraform initialization will actually catch any issues with the, um, or I won't actually catch that issue at all because it's not it's not a breaking problem for Terraform. It's just a syntactical issue, and it's it's more of a, a code style and quality problem than anything else. So that's why the test job passes there. So if we go ahead now and create a merge request from deliberate failure branch, again we have to go and change the destination or target branch, as I should say, just using the GitLab um, GitLab vernacular. We're going to go and change our target branch to test. And we're going to go again, compare the branches and continue. Okay, so we're going to call this one deliberate failure. So do not worry. Do not panic. Can we make that red? I'll do it in bold. There we go. Okay, so untick delete options here. 
submit merge request. Now, we're never actually going to merge this request as we're introducing some deliberate failure. So I could have just left those values as default. Okay. This time around, if we go to our detached merge pipeline, again, by clicking on this ID link here, we can now see it's executing because the status has gone from um, pause to blue, which means it's in progress. So if we go and open up our pipeline. What we can see now is that although the merge plan in for a job is still executing, merge lint terraform here has failed. Now we can go and view the execution output logs here if we want to go into that, that big output log. But what we can do is we can actually go to this test tab now. So GitLab CI CD supports um, JUnit format test results. Now JUnit is a Java testing tool um, that has a very, very commonly used um, test output format, which is, I think it's, it uses XML files. And um, lots and lots of different testing tools actually allow you to output to this format, including TFLint. So um, as I said, we can click on the tab, the tab directly, the test tab here, and we can see that one test is executed. And in this case, we have one failure listed on this job, which we can see down here. So if we go and click on this job, Merge lib terraform. We can see the test suite here is the file name for ter the terraform file that we added in before, which is outputs.tf. And the test that failed is called terraform deprecated interpolation, right? So this test was is is to look at um, the syntax used in terraform interpolations, which is what we do when we use um, values from different terraform resources. Um, to make sure that we're not using any deprecated syntaxes. So again, you can see this trace of which here. So you can see line six, column 11, warning interpolation only expressions are deprecated in Terraform 12.14. Uh, so there we go. We validated that our linting tool will actually catch any errors that we introduce into the code. So that has actually wrapped up um, the hands-on session at least from um my tutorial side anyway so i think i'll spend the uh the next five ten minutes actually addressing any comments questions feedback that you guys have so please please feel free to reach out on on youtube comments now and the support team will be, be in touch what we're going to do is just go and have a look at um our our destroy not our destroy let's go have a look at our ci cd for production just to make sure that we actually deployed correctly this time Uh, we can see here that we have a deployed to and for prod, deploy static, that's all good there. And again, I'm just going to do as a bit of housekeeping, I am going to go and tear down the production. So let's go and create a to-do list here. So there we go. I'm going to go ahead and create my item now. I'm going to go and click this button. We're going to mark this in progress. And in theory, we're never going to reach the already done stage. At least I hope not anyway. So let's keep an eye on our destroy job. Now, at this stage, we'd usually be um, networking over pizza and um, sharing any any uh, feedback. Unfortunately, as uh, everyone else in the world is doing, we have to uh, have to do this remotely. But um, hopefully, in the next six months or so, we should actually be able to get back to doing um, playgrounds in person. But uh, I'd like to just say a massive thank you for everybody for joining me tonight. Again, I couldn't share any pizza with you, so I just wore my my pizza T-shirt instead. Um, I'd also like to give a massive thank you to all our playground helpers who were um, offering us assistance tonight. And um, most importantly, thank you very much for attending and watching. I really, really hope you enjoyed this and got something out of it. So that's uh, that wraps it up from me. Again, thank you. Thank you very much for watching.